I could just say a word about um, the review. I'm not sure how much you know, but um, we've been right around the country talking to um, a lot of people who have suffered from uh, sodium valparate, um, Primados, uh, the two medications that have resulted in, or we believe there might be an association uh, with children who have been uh, disabled, and then with surgical mesh, which is inserted for um, uh, stress urinary incontinence. So today we're really drawing on the work that you've done, um, and uh, slightly concerned with epilepsy and uh, the problems that that brings. Um, and if I could just introduce um, my colleagues, um, on my far right is uh, Valerie Ross. Hello. Valerie Ross, and she's the uh, secretary to the review. Um, next to her, Simon Whale, who is a panel member of the review. As I am, I'm Julia Cumberledge, and chairing the review. Um, my vice chairman sends his apologies, um, uh, uh, Cyril Chancellor. Um, so Cyril Chancellor, he's not here today because he's doing something else for us today. And then on my left is Sandy McLeod, who's our principal researcher, so that's us. Um, from the point of view of the screening, and I hope this is all right for you, that um, we are very anxious with the review that we should be open and honest, transparent, so people really um, would appreciate that we are saying everything that we're doing so nothing is hidden, there's no secrecy or anything like that which has caused problems in the past. And um, uh, so uh, we are screening it and hope that's, that's all right. It's fine. And then in the room also we've got people here who are helping us just uh, run this session. So um, I don't know if first of all you'd like to say anything about your organisations um, epilepsy Action and Epilepsy Society uh, that you think that we really um, ought to know about, which you haven't included uh, in the material that you've already sent us, which uh, has been very helpful. But is there anything in particular you'd like to? So, uh, if I may, I'll, I'll go first. Um, may I also apologise? I've had the worst sore throat the last three days, so if my voice goes halfway through, I do apologise, but I'll, I'll try and carry on. But if I can't, yes, I had a, a really bad sore throat for the last few days. Oh, I'm so sorry. So my, my voice isn't quite where oh, it should be, so just, yeah. just shout at me if you can't hear me, and I'll try again. Okay. Um, obviously, thank you for the opportunity to come and uh, present. Uh, evidence to the inquiry and we're really grateful for the opportunity and we think it's a really important uh, opportunity. Um, I would say it's well recognised that sodium valproate can harm the unborn child. I think there's 30, 40 years of evidence, and particularly in the last 10, 20 years, I don't think there's any real doubt that that, that does happen. And we would suggest that warnings have been around since Actually, the introduction of sodium valproate in the early 1970s, 1973, 1974. And they've been strengthened over the years as more knowledge has become available, including, I would say, probably critically uh, in the early 2000s when the NICE clinical guideline was introduced. And as an example, that had as one recommendation that clinicians should discuss with women and the girls of childbearing potential and their parents or carers the risk of AEDs causing malformations and possible neurodevelopmental impairments. Now, NICE is internationally recognised that piece of guidance that they've included is really very strong and should have made a lot of clinicians sit up. Uh, the guidance was further strengthened in 2011 when NICE introduced the Quality and Outcomes Framework Indicator for Preconception Counselling. Uh, we felt that was a very important market to try and help improve preconception counselling and so it was doubly disappointing uh, a that it took so long to introduce but even more disappointing that it was retired uh, by uh, the, the, from the framework in 2014 without any consultation or discussion. Epilepsy Action has been active over the years in trying to raise awareness of the issues around Valparate and have included with our submitted evidence a timeline of some of the activity. But since at least 1987 we have referenced the risks of fetal abnormalities in our patient information and the need for preconception counselling to enable women to make informed choices about their care and treatment. We've run a series of awareness programmes over several years 
aimed at reducing the risks to mother and baby during pregnancy. For example, in 2002, we carried out uh, our first IV World Survey, which was specifically focused on willing, women and the challenges that they face. And it highlighted that women were not receiving a bit information about the impacts of their treatment. In 2003, we published the first version of our GP Epilepsy Resource Pack that was distributed on request to over 10,000 GP surgeries, which, among other things, it highlighted the issues around teratogenicity. Other public awareness campaigns in 2007, 8, 2011, 2013, I could go on. I think throughout this time, what we're trying to suggest is clinicians really should have been aware of the potential impact of sodium valparate on the unborn child. And as a minimum, they should have been counselling women about the potential risks so that they could take informed choices. It's clear that that has not happened. It, may have, it has happened in parts, we would agree with that, but it's <coughs> clearly not happened to the extent that it should. Otherwise, so many children wouldn't have been born with fetal anticonvulsant syndrome. And we think there is a question to be asked as to why it took the MHRA until 2014 to look at this and to start to take regulatory action. We accept we as an organisation didn't actually ask them to, and perhaps we might have, but actually we think that is their role to proactively identify these issues in medication and take action. Even having started to take action in 2016 with the Valparate tool Toolkit, evidence that both ourselves, Epilepsy Society and Young Epilepsy uh, found from a survey in two of 2,000 women in 2017, almost one in five women at the time did not know of the harm. This was a year after the introduction of the latest toolkit. More than a quarter of women taking Valparate had not been given information about the risks to the unborn child. More than two thirds of women have not received the MRHRA's packs that were developed for women with epilepsy taking Valparate at that time. We, again, we also have to ask why clinicians were not paying heed to the wealth of evidence and guidance available and undertaking proper preconception counselling. We recognise clinicians are busy, they have many com competing demands on their time, but we believe this is, this was important that they should have done better. If I may just briefly look forwards, um, Epilepsy Action welcomes the current warnings, strengthened warnings around sodium valparate and the pregnancy prevention programme. We have been working with the MHRA, with clinicians and others as part of the MHRA Valparate Stakeholders Group. And we're particularly pleased that in the last few weeks they've revised the annual risk acknowledgement form, that it's now a better form for use in our judgment. We also welcome the guidance that's been issued, and I don't know whether you've seen this, it's only come out in the last two weeks from the Royal Colleges, a guidance document on vulparate use in women's and girl, women and girls of childbearing year, years, which again we think is an excellent support tool for clinicians involved with counselling women about sodium valparate. We have to remember Valparate is an excellent drug for epilepsy and can save lives and I think that's one of the issues that is, is very difficult to balance in this issue and I think the new guidance does help do that somewhat. What we do want to know though is whether these measures are actually being implemented um, and whether women are receiving the relevant information, are they having the call for annual reviews, are they uh, getting the support they need to make the right decisions. In the light of that, ourselves with Young Epilepsy and Epilepsy Society will be redoing the survey that we did in 2017 over the next few months to look at take up of the new uh, pregnancy prevention program to find out whether it is being implemented and indeed how women are finding the Im implementation of it as well. Actually, is it working for them? If the PPP and the associated toolkit is used effectively, I think our view is we would expect to see a significant reduction in the number of children born with fetal anticonvulsant syndrome. It has the merits that it should work is our initial view, but we do want to see that. But I do want to add an however here, and that is that sodium valparate isn't the only teratogen as far as women with epilepsy are concerned. There is increasing evidence that other anti-epileptic drugs, including carbamazepine, ethosuximide, phosphenitoin, phenobarbital, primidone, topiramate, are all teratogenic. A recent study using the North American AED Pregnancy Registry provided estimates of the risks of major malformations among, uh, among infants exposed to specific AEDs 
as monotherapy during the first trimester of pregnancy. They reported a risk of malformation of 9.3% for bulk rate, which we know about, but 5.5% for phenobarbital, 4.2% for tapiramate, 3% for carbamazepine, 2% for phenytoin. Despite this increasing evidence, we've seen no willingness on behalf of the MHRA or others to consider what needs to be done to reduce the potential harm to children, to the unborn children of women taking those drugs. And as a lesson learned from this important review, we would hope that that is highlighted, that it is not just looking back, it is also looking forwards about what needs to be done. One lesson, surely, that we can learn from the damage caused by Valparate, and indeed still being caused, is that action needs to be taken and taken now. We can't wait for 40 years before those drugs are critically reviewed and appropriate measures taken. Uh, drawing to your close, you'll be pleased to know. Um, we also believe that the Quality and Outcomes Framework, if it is to continue, should reintroduce an indicator for, pre for preconception counselling. We're aware that uh, there has been a quality improvement activity indicator included in the Quality and Outcomes Framework, uh, which is particularly looking at Valparate reviews within GP practices, and we welcome that. But preconception counselling for people with epilepsy, A, needs to cover those other drugs that we talked about, but it's also wider <coughs> than the particular drug. There are drug contraceptive interactions that men need to be aware of. There is the impact of pregnancy on seizure rates and the safety. And there is also the important factor that maternal deaths in women with epilepsy is 10 times the rate of the general population. Again, another reason why preconception counselling is also important. It's not just Valparate from our perspective. We're aware that there is talk of an NHS audit or registry of women with epilepsy. And the, again, at the moment, we believe it's just looking at Valparate. And so I'm going to make the point again that we do believe you can't just look at Valparate in isolation. We've got to think of those other drugs and the potential impact. Um, so we would hope that that would be widened to all women with childbearing age or with another hat on all people with epilepsy put simply because there are many other issues that we aren't covering in this inquiry that a registry would help with. Um, finally, just two points. The first is that we obviously all need to pay tribute to the uh, campaigning of the groups who've actually brought this uh, inquiry into being. Their work has been tireless, they have uh, very profound issues that they have to cope with as well as raising awareness and we would pay tribute to them. And finally, Epilepsy Action would also support the call for some sort of support mechanism, uh, including financial support for those affected by fetal anticonvulsant syndrome. Uh, we think this should be above and beyond the standard disability support that ministers seem to trot out every time the question is answered. Um, and we would suggest that it could be linked to the oft-debated idea of NHS no-fault compensation. Uh, the potentially avoidable damage to children with epilepsy from sodium valproate uh, is a, a wide issue. I, I don't envy your task. It will be a challenge to isolate one or even two factors. I would suggest that this is a prime opportunity for no-fault compensation to be introduced whereby the children affected by sodium valproate can receive some additional financial support to help them live their lives as well as they can. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps I ought to make it clear just uh, on the um, screening that's going on uh, that you are Simon Wigglesworth and you're the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of Epilepsy Action. I am, sorry. I and now we're myself. moving on <laughs> to the Epilepsy Society and it's Claire Pelham who's the Chief Executive Officer. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm I was really pleased when I read your guidance notes that what you really wanted to have was a conversation because I participated in a fair number of these sorts of events, both sides of the table actually, because my background is as, as a senior civil servant. And, and I think when we're trying to learn and improve, that's the single most important thing we can do is share our learning and see what we can come up with together. Um, you asked a little bit about the charity and I'm sure your secretariat have provided you with everything that's on the website. So the only thing that I would want to pull out here and now is our values. The acronym is Cairo, Caring, Accountable, Improving, Respectful and Open. And we're here to learn. 
including on behalf of the charity, because I think the charity has a lot to learn from the way we've behaved over the last 40 years, and we are learning that, and we're trying to improve. So we're here not in a spirit of criticism, but in a spirit of shared learning. That's, that's what we're trying to do as a result of this um, long-running episode. I think the only other thing that I ought to say is that, um, because it may be helpful, my personal perspective is informed by my past as a senior civil servant, but also I think this is relevant because I have been both a sponsor of arm's length bodies and a chief executive of an arm's length body. So I've got some experience of what feels normal in that relationship. And that may be relevant as the conversation progresses. So I think what I want to say by way of an opening statement is to highlight two issues that I think are helpful in the diagnosis of what went wrong and why. And, and they are not in order of importance, but the two that we've identified are a failure of listening and a failure of regulation. Sorry, a failure of listening and a failure, failure of regulation. Right. So just to amplify that a little, I think Jeremy Hunt talked about it. I think you've seen our blogs, our tweets, our, all the stuff that's in the public domain about listening. And obviously listening is a great skill and it's hard. It's hard for all of us to practice. The particular aspect of listening that bothers me about this is listening to women. The question that I've asked myself repeatedly is, would we be here today if sodium valproate was an issue that affected men? And I don't think we would be. I really don't. And that's partly informed by my personal experience. Um, as a newcomer to the world of medicine and experiencing for myself some of the, the values and behaviours that I see practised. Um, but it's partly going back and listening to um, the people who've participated in various conversations. Um, it's harsh, but not, I think, unfair to say that if not today, over the last past 40 years, that we have been living through, the victims have been living through a patriarchal system where the, the phrase that's used is white coat syndrome. White coat syndrome was as pervasive as an epidemic. And I'm not sure whether it's because the primary people affected were women, or because they were disabled women, or because they were disabled mothers, or because their disabilities were hidden, but there is something there, I think, that is bothering. And, and I think it continues to bother me, actually, because, um, and this may be a point that you want to explore, because I'm not entirely convinced that that problem has been dealt with. And, and I say that advisedly, and perhaps I should come on now to talk about regulation. Um, and I'm only making these points briefly, and perhaps we can explore them later. As I said, I've, I've been chief executive of an arm's length body, um, for five years or so. During that period, I gave evidence in public to dozens of times. I met with ministers, I completed audits, I helped draft answers to PQs, I did KPIs, I was scrutinised to within an inch of my life. You know, there really wasn't a week where we weren't held accountable for something or other. That doesn't seem to me to be the environment at the MHRA. I've tried really hard to look and see what's on the record there in terms of things like appraisals, debates, select committee evidence, published KPIs, public hearings, all of the routine that I would regard as absolutely normal. And I can't find them. I mean, there's something in 2004, you may find a health select committee session, you may have found others, but it bothers me, and it bothers me quite a lot because, you know, to coin a phrase, sunlight is, is, is the enemy, isn't it, of, of this shady secrecy that's been practised around this, this regulatory um, regime that we've got. You open this session by saying, isn't it good to be open so that people can see what's happening? And I would say yes. I was asked by the MHRA to be a member of their expert working group on sodium valparate. I thought, fantastic, isn't that great? We're going to be part of the solution. The very first thing that happened was I was asked to sign a confidentiality document. So I probably can't tell you too much about what happened in that room. I have 
been a senior civil servant for more years than I can remember. I am really used to keeping things confidential that need to be kept confidential. And believe me, there was nothing in that room that couldn't have been done in the open. The only thing that happened in that room that couldn't have been done in the open, perhaps to the embarrassment of the MHRA, was that we moved seamlessly from not listening to women saying there was a problem to not listening to women saying how it could be improved. So, and I'm speaking personally here because I am respectful of the agreement that I signed, but I have in all my years in public service never participated in a body where the opinion of experts was so roundly ignored by public officials. And honestly, astonishing. Astonishing. And I think there's a real question here about why does it need to be in secret when the whole dynamic is that there's been too much secrecy and what's happening to the listening? I think I would just stop there. Mm. Well, thank you both of you. Um, that's really, really helpful. Um, can I just ask you, um, first of all, Claire, if I may call you that. Of course. Um, the failure of listening. Yeah. Um, can you just explain a, a bit more about that? Because one of the things that uh, we are very conscious of is that this review was set up by parliamentarians. It's set up by the Secretary of State. And um, the issue was that some of these conditions that we were asked to examine have been going on for many years, and uh, yet nobody has really listened mm. to what has been happening. And so we've been working with the patient groups, and I have to say they are very, very impressive, and I can't use patient groups. Um, the science that they have actually unearthed, uh, the, the <coughs> secrecy they've unearthed, as uh, you have also mentioned. And um, I'm just wondering for the future, um, when our review has been uh, concluded and we have reported, how can we actually ensure that, um, that patients have a voice and that they are really heard? Mm. How can we do that? Mm. How, how, what are the mechanisms? Yeah. What are the sort of uh, the things that we have to yeah. instill, that we have to ensure yeah. happens in the future? I started, as I often start to be honest, with our values because I think it helps just to keep mm. us honest and, and on the right track. And I think there is something about values. And I, I I don't know if this is a matter for medical education or if this is a matter for values-based recruitment to bodies such as the MHRA. <coughs> I think there's something around humility. And I think it's not the same at all levels. So I, I don't want to talk in black and white because of course you know, we're all individuals and we all have done different things at different times in different ways. But I think there is a tendency, or at least has been a tendency, at the senior levels of the medical profession and perhaps more embedded in those who are now occupying positions of authority that the doctor knows best. That these are by definition because they are potential mothers, largely younger women and, and, and that um, perhaps they are, uh, they are women with disabilities and perhaps that wrongly, completely wrongly in my view, prom prompts a certain paternalistic approach and a failure to listen, which is, is just really depressing. And I think if I, if I were recruiting folk to the MHRA, I would have a values-based recruitment system where I, I would be very interested, not just in recruiting bright and able young people, young people, older people, I'm not, I don't want to be ageist about it, people who are able, but people who have a certain humility, what you might call a true academic, people who are willing to learn wherever learning is found. And it is so often found in the patient. One of my, one of, in fact it's the research director at the Epilepsy Society, said to me, I always listen to patients because patients are never wrong. And, and I think that's just a wonderful mindset. Because mm. if that's where you start, how can you go wrong? And I think there has been a lack of humility. Do you want to comment? Uh, thank you. I mean, uh, just to add, uh, part of my modus operandi is, is pragmatics. And, and first of all, I'm, I'm not on the stakeholder group. So whilst I have staff that are on it, I don't know the detail of what goes on. And I think Claire's right. I've had other 
uh, interactions with MHRA around anti-epileptic drugs where we made some suggestions and submissions about some guidance they would introduced and it took a year and a half for anything to come out the other end. And in the meantime, we were in the total dark about what was, what was being discussed and considered. So certainly I would agree that some mechanism of openness, perhaps of their meetings, certainly publishing minutes of documents, papers beforehand. <coughs> Excuse me. Obviously we do need to recognise that some of the work they're doing may be commercially confidential in terms of licensing drugs and that sort of thing. But I can't think of much around Valproate, given that the main manufacturer was also involved in those meetings, or the other issues that I were doing that uh, impacted on confidentiality. So certainly I think greater openness uh, is there. <coughs> I, I'm, or, or we're also perhaps not as, as uh, I'm, I'm not saying the MHR hasn't done things wrong, but I do think we have to go back to doctors as well, and it may be this paternalistic attitude, although there are lots of women doctors and maybe they, they have the same attitudes as well. Um, but in truth, I suspect they didn't have time, they didn't know, they didn't think it was important. And I, the, the question is, why, why do they not think when the words something like this is teratogenic should be flashing big headlines in front of them saying, hold on a minute, I can do some real damage if I prescribe this. And I just wonder, maybe they need to, now with more technology and we've heard of alerts, fatigue syndromes and all those sorts of things, but there need to be mechanisms when dangerous drugs, this is what they are, they're dangerous drugs as far as the unborn child or being prescribed, there needs to be a mechanism that makes sure, now we've now got that mechanism for Valproate, but as I said in my earlier piece, we don't have the same mechanism for all those other teratogens. And there will be other drugs elsewhere with other equally devastating impacts. And there'll be warnings on PILs and SPCs and so on and so forth. But what is it that gets, what mechanism can be introduced to get the doctor to think about that at the time of prescribing? Because I think that's incredibly important. Could I, could I just a supplement what Simon said, if, that, if that's with your permission? Um, firstly, I'd, I'd just like to say, um, I was referring to the expert working group, not, not the stakeholder group, but absolutely, without any question of a doubt, there was nothing that was commercially confidential in those discussions, nothing. And the, the body I was talking about, where we had practised openness, did deal with very difficult and sensitive personnel discussions. So I, I'm absolutely certain that it's possible to have an open arm's length body within the constraints which MHRA operated. <coughs> But I'm trying to respond to your question more precisely about what could be done differently in future. So um, you mentioned that the impetus for this review came from Parliament. So and that's you know let's credit where credit is due. That's great. So that shows that something worked. That our that our democracy functioned. That people were heard. It took a long time, and some of that, of you know, we we have to pay tribute over and over again to the wonderful campaigners who've made this possible. Um, all credit to them, but democracy worked. I think in my dealings with MHRA, I don't want to overstate the point, um, the link between ministers and the arm's length body was so remote and ethereal as to be almost invisible. So um, I've worked in a ministerial private office. We all know how that works. Ministers are responsible for their arm's length bodies. That's not how it feels when you talk to staff at the MHRA. They don't feel, I mean, they don't feel that connection, that degree of answerability, and so I would posit that the democratic link is broken. So, not to give specifics, because I've signed this piece of paper, but I did at one point read out something that was said in Parliament by the Secretary of State, and that was regarded as fairly advisory not a suggestion, not, not, a, not something to be delivered. And so coming to your question about what could be done differently, I think staff need to ventilate there. I think they need to move in and out more frequently. I think five years is plenty in an arm's length body actually. It needs to become somewhere that people go, build their career and at least some of them get promoted out of quite quickly so that you break that slightly fossilised, slightly dusty 
culture of deference to the senior people there. So there's no, I don't sense there's a very rigorous intellectual challenge going on. In any way at all department you'll have fierce arguments. I didn't feel that. Now that might be because we were outsiders and it was well hidden. But I think it's a good discipline to keep refreshing the cast. That's how you bring in new ideas and new sensitivities and new approaches to problems. Um, the other thing I think I would mention, I was formerly chief exec at then at Cheshire, and we talked an awful lot there about the social model of disability, so much so that I thought it was absolutely ran through the DNA of everybody who dealt with disabled people. And it was quite a surprise to me to find large aspects of the medical profession knew nothing about it. Now, now that is a real lack of broad education of the subject that they're dealing with. If you're dealing with disabled people every day, to be still thinking in terms of the medical model all of these years afterwards shows a lack of broad understanding of the concept of disability, I would suggest. So when I adverted earlier to medical education, I, I think it has to cover the social model of disability and it needs to be part of refresher training. Thank you very much indeed. A lot to think about. Um, I'd like to go on now to the NICE guidelines um, on the management of uh, epilepsies. And um, just to ask you um, whether you've had any feedback from your members on that. Uh, it was about the diagnosis and the management um, of epilepsy. Sorry, can I clarify in terms of feedback what, whether you think that we think the guidelines are? had any view on the recent guidelines? Uh, I mean, I certainly uh, we as an organisation, and I suspect I can speak for all the epilepsy organisations, back in 2004 when the NICE epilepsy guidelines first came out, uh, were largely delighted with the content of them. I think the guidelines in terms of what they covered was the f back then was the first time that a fairly comprehensive document covering most of the issues around epilepsy and how it can and should be managed but put together based on evidence largely, the, some bits based on clinical opinion. Um, and I guess naively we, we thought this is the beginning of transformation of care for people with epilepsy. And um, I know you've had NICE in here, and you know the, the, the big question around NICE guidance is, it's just guidance. And clinicians aren't held to account as to whether they deliver it or not. Um, and clearly, I, I quoted from one of the areas where the NICE guidance says, you should do an annual review and you should talk about the teratogenic effects of the AEDs, and that's not happening. So the content of the guidance, it can be improved, and there's another review going on, and we're all contributing to that, and we can improve it. But the guidance as it stands, certainly we think it, it, it's fabulous, and we, we have high hopes. Um, the reality is, in areas of best practice, it's followed, it's making a difference. In the areas where there are less experts, in epilepsy in, uh, in particular, it's probably I suspect sitting on the shelf referred to occasionally but not really understood what it contains or the evidence on the ground in terms of how they then look after their patients with epilepsy would suggest that it's not being followed particularly closely. Mm. I, think, I think the only thing I would say is that we've had feedback and I have no way of, of understanding whether this is fair or reasonable <coughs> but from several medics that the only things that they pay attention to are things which fill the screen with red and are marked urgent and mandatory, and things which are called guidance just slip to the bottom of the heap. And I have no way of knowing if that's fair or reasonable. The other end of the spectrum is we also know not one, not, not two, certainly tens of people with epilepsy who haven't just had a review every year, but haven't had a review every decade. I mean, I, uh, this is not an exaggeration, and particularly um, if you live a long way from a hospital or if you have other disabilities which mean that it's difficult for you to travel or perhaps you live in social care, you may, you may not have a review for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. There are still people who are taking the same medication that they were prescribed as children. Mm. Sorry, if I may just have one um, brief... 
I'm sorry, I was just wondering yeah, if you'd mm-hmm. like to. Yes, I did. There was, uh, and I wonder whether this has been fed back to you, but it has been pointed out to me that there is actually an inherent contradiction in the new nice guidelines, and I didn't know whether this, your members had felt this was the same. So it's very clear that under the heading women and girls with epilepsy, when the guidelines are saying very clearly you must be discussing the risks of taking anti-epileptic drugs, taking sodium evaporate because of the malformations and possible neurodevelopmental delays, and that there has to be that assessment and a full discussion between the prescribing doctor and the young person. However, when you go on to the heading pharmacological treatment of juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, it says first-line treatment of children, young people, and adults with JME offer sodium valproate as first-line treatment, and doesn't then go on to spell out all that you should be doing <coughs> around that. And Absolutely. of course, you've got yeah. an MHRA program that makes it very clear that GPs should not be offering sodium valproate to children and young women yeah. uh, of childbearing age. And so th- there's a question in here, have we got an inherent contradiction? Is there a problem about this? If I'm a clinician sitting in a GP surgery, yeah looking at both of these, thinking, okay, which one trumps? I mean, I, I think I would say two things, if I may, and that is that certainly with children and girls under the age of 18, they will not be being uh, diagnosed or prescribed by a GP. They will all be being diagnosed and prescribed in secondary care under the care of a pediatrician. And will that Who, neurologist or pediatrician be facing the same dilemma? I think they'll be facing the same dilemma, but I think one of the things which, which is the, the, the extra point I was going to make, things are slightly different in pediatrics at the moment, and that's because of something called Epilepsy 12, which is a national audit of the care and treatment of young people within epilepsy clinics all over the UK, where they are audited against various standards, including those within NICE guidelines, so that if you like, they're being measured as to whether whether they are actually following nice guidance, because that's the, the cornerstone of, of the 12 markers that they use within Epilepsy 12. So I think there's an interesting um, divergence in there, and the current review will certainly give us the chance to, to flag it up. I, I, I'm not sure it's a major issue. I think the numbers I've seen that first prescriptions for girls and young women with epilepsy for Valparate have been reducing really quite significantly recently. Um, but, it is, but it is still a damn good drug well, that's what for you'd things expect. like JME. That's what you'd expect, but the issue here is it's actually saying offer sodium valproate. Yeah, and, and, it, and it should, yeah. it should as, as you suggest, I would agree, and we'll make that point in, in the meetings with NICE when they revise it, that they should be you know, adding in. The latest guidance uh, from the MHRA and the Pregnancy Prevention Programme has been added in to the NICE guideline in the last uh, few months, as it were, as a, also an, almost an addendum. I don't think they've gone through and cross-referenced it line by line, which clearly they need to do, and there is a current review going on, so that should get picked up. Could I offer a slightly different view? <laughs> Um, and also, perhaps, if, if you would permit, um, talk about the Pregnancy Prevention Programme as a, as a phrase. Um, so, I observe a tendency in this area for people who write guidance to fudge questions through slightly obscure drafting. So, so as you dissect it, as we've been able to in this working group, to say precisely what do you mean by that, the real answer is that the person writing it, and I often have a great deal of sympathy for them because the person with the pen or the keyboard is often a relatively junior person who's been told two quite different things by quite senior people and has tried to find a way of marrying the two. And, and, and so the drafting often reflects an inherent confusion. And I think you're right, it isn't. The confusion is there, you've highlighted it. I, the observation I would make is that in the discussions we've had about trying to improve communications, there's been a a slightly old-fashioned idea prevalent about the way that young women behave, and uh, as if there were no sexually active 12-year-olds in the country, and that if there were, they would be very happy to chat to their doctor about their sexual practices in front of their parents. And there is a certain degree of just otherworldliness in some of this guidance. And I think it just needs to be clearer and more specific about all the wide variety of human circumstances that may be present in a doctor's office when they're having this conversation. People with learning disabilities, people from 
families with multiple challenges and it needs to be very clear and specific and I think it isn't. Um, and while I'm on this theme, if I may, I, I personally roundly dislike the phrase pregnancy prevention programme. I have done everything I can to ask, persuade, cajole the MHRA into only using it in expert circumstances. We do not have a pregnancy prevention programme and it is offensive to women to, for who should make informed choices about these things to say that we do and worse than offensive it is counterproductive because we know from the dealings we've had with people who have religious beliefs which preclude them from preventing pregnancies that this deters them from having this conversation with their doctor because they think that the only option is to not have a baby and they may wish to take an informed choice to have a baby in, and take sodium valproate. And never has something so straightforward been made so difficult and so obscure by a group of such intelligent people. I honestly despair. I, I don't know how to be any clearer about it than that. That, that a nationally recognised body should call a programme something which it isn't. It's just despair making. What should it well, the terms that have been offered, pregnancy management, pregnancy support, or it could be called a whole variety of other, I mean, numerous suggestions have been made. Does it work? The programme. We are conducting a rerun of our survey in the autumn, and I really, really hope so. I really hope so. So we know from the last survey that, and I'm not saying it's the last word in statistical rigour, nobody could say 2,000 people is the best statistical practice, um, but 20% of the people who were currently taking sodium valproate um, then did not know. Um, I hope it's fewer. I don't think, my guess is, it's not going to be many fewer. Um, we made... We have made numerous suggestions to the MHRA about communications programmes, about looking for further funding from central pots, for getting in central government communications advisers, for making a bid to the Treasury for supplementary funds, for this, that and the other. And the answer has been that they have limited funds available. And I don't think the amount of communications that have been done, let alone the way that it's been done, will have the effect that's been looking for. Can I just ask whether you think AMHRA is the right body to be overseeing this issue, if you want to call it that. Are they the right, given all that you yep. said, both yep. of you, yep. are they the right body or does this prompt a question about who should have responsibility, who's better placed to, or whether there is anyone who's yep. better placed to? So I, I understand exactly why you asked the question. Um, so in theory, clearly not, because you know, there is something truly bizarre about um, the body that regulates being in charge of what is essentially a public education, public health question. There are other people better placed to do that. On the other side of that coin, you might say there's also something to be said for the expertise being close to the communications, and it doesn't really matter where the lead is as long as both groups talk to each other, which they don't. But I, the reason I'm pausing is I'm really, I really hope that you don't, if I may say so, recommend structural changes. Because structural changes are so often attractive, but so rarely resolve the underlying problem. What we do is shuffle the deck chairs a little bit, we have some new bodies, we have some new people running some new bodies, they take a while to bed in, and things go into a bit of a black hole, and then three or four years later they say they've got hold of the issue and they're gonna deal with it. So I really hope that we can work with the bodies we've got and not just move the deck chairs around, but they need to work within, if I may call it this, the health family, drawing upon the expertise that there is within the sponsored and arm's length bodies that DH, DH, I see as it now is, have within their ambit. So they ought to be closer and cooperative. I'm not so fussed about where it comes from as the fact that they liaise properly within the health arena and, and much more importantly, they seem to be operating in a vacuum away from the whole of Whitehall. So, so there's things like the government communication service. There's huge expertise in the public service about how to get messages out there. And, and, yet, and yet it's not accessed and deployed in what is, after all, a major national scandal. I think if I'm, I might add, um, and I don't know who else I might suggest, I think the one advantage of the MHRA that I can think of 
is they actually have some regulatory clout. Whether they use it effectively or not is a, perhaps another question. If we were to go to someone like NICE, we've discussed the problems of their guidance, it being just guidance. They are probably the experts in producing the type of guidance and the issues that Claire's highlighted around religion, people with disabilities and all, all the rest of it are real issues and actually just to go back I do think the Royal Colleges have done some quite good work in their latest guidance to address all those issues uh, in a far better way than the original uh, fairly bland uh, directives for want of a better word that came in from the MHRA and the Valpre Toolkit and now the PPP. Um, so I think if it were to be anyone else overseeing it, they need some sort of clout to make it happen and I think that's again the big issue, one of the big problems. Nice guidance isn't compulsory. Um, the, the other people I guess who could issue guidance and make it compulsory are the JMC because they oversee medical practice. And they're about the only two people who can make rules that I'm aware of to make these sorts of things happen. And it's clear that it's been talked about. I, I slightly disagree with Claire's uh, credit to the, um, maybe to the current political system. I've got a note of a question in 2000 to the Secretary of State asking exactly the same questions as to how many people are being affected by Valkyrie, what are the government doing to reduce the incidences of, of, of uh, teratogenic effects and so on and so forth. So they've known about it for years and it has taken an awful long time, so it does need some sort of clout to make it happen. Maybe the changes to licensing, which the MHRA have done, are the one thing that will trigger real action now. Can you come at it a different way, and um, not look at the body that's overseeing <coughs> the PPP, but ask, is the PPP actually deliverable? And if it isn't, what then? So I mean, I'm not sure you would ever know now what your survey is going to come up with in a couple of months' time, yeah. but yeah. let's say it's not showing an improvement as you fear and suspect. Yeah. What then? So I, I think, if I may say so, I think it's an excellent question. The question I, we often sit around and talk, which is, if we were the Secretary of State for Health and we wanted to make this work, what would we do? And I know exactly what I would do, and, I would, and, and it wouldn't be what they have done. So I think it, so I'm not going to call it that set of names. So if you wanted to have a program that ensured that every woman made an informed choice before she accepted a prescription of sodium valparate, um, I think it is deliverable, yes. I think we've done many harder things in, in the medical field and, and you know, in, in life generally, actually. We, we've implemented many more difficult things. I think that, as a task, is, is circumscribed by the number of people and, and we can get our arms around it and make it work. But to do that, you need to have the right incentives, you need to have the right communications, and you need to have the right monitoring. And I don't think we've got any aspects of that right. And you need to have, I mean, it's a classic piece of project management. So one thing you might have done was have a PRINCE2 programme around it, in which you get continuous feedback, so you're continually monitoring and improving as you go along. That would have been a very straightforward feedback loop to have put in place, but as far as I'm aware, it hasn't been done. So yes, I'm certain it is deliverable. Uh, I'm not sure the way that it's been tackled in this instance will prove to be effective. Who delivers it? Who oversees it? Um, who, whoever sees it now. No, who should? Who should oversee who it? Who deliver Who should deliver it? Who should incentivize it? How do you, on a practical level? So, so I, I, um, I have a slightly traditional view of these things, which is the democratically responsible person is the Secretary of State, and that there is a, a flow of responsibility from there. And that's why I started with the importance of arm's length bodies being held to account via ministers, because that's the democratic link, and that's where how I think we got into a democratic deficit in this area. So I don't think... I have particularly strong views about naming one person to be responsible as to which person it is. As long as they know they're responsible, they feel responsible, they troll along to the select committee and start their evidence with, yes, I am the person responsible for making this work, and they can co-opt and have the mandate to make it work. It's, if you like, a very comparable system to um, public sector IT projects. If you ask who the single responsible owner is for any IT project in government, there will be a named person. Well, this is a project, 
and it ought to have a named person. Isn't one of the challenges of the whole um, programme <coughs> uh, that children are put on to sodium valparate at quite a young age if they're epileptic yeah. and um, nobody actually makes the break yeah. when they become childbearing age. So they continue to have it and they continue to be prescribed and it's dispensed and they take yeah. it. Um, and so nobody, when they get to perhaps 12, 13 or something, does a break. Yeah. So who does the break? So I think that has to be centrally imposed. And I think, if I may say so, it has to come before the young girl is of childbearing age. So, so one of the most bizarre conversations I've had in, in professionally for a long time was we did a bit of a role play about if you're a teenage girl and you... How, how and at what time is the right time to have a conversation about becoming pregnant? And um, with some very eminent medical people, I was trying to explain, it's before you have sex, not after you have sex. So exactly on this, in this instant, the doctors need to have the conversation with young girls before they're of childbearing potential so that they're aware that this is among the issues that they need to contend with. So we need to make sure that the alerts are triggered sufficiently early for the girl to absorb the information, for her to, to think that through, for an opportunity to have a discussion without her parents. There are lots of issues to be worked through and you may not have more than a year or two to do them in. I think I'm, I'm going to slightly disagree with Claire that it might be all well and good for the Secretary of State to be responsible, but the person who has to have that conversation is the doctor. And that in, in that instance it's a paediatrician, uh, hopefully with expertise in epilepsy and they have to have the conversation and there has to be a mechanism to ensure that they have that conversation and they have it in sufficient time so that they have it before they're likely to or be able to get pregnant or start having sex and so yes there needs to be a system and it shouldn't be beyond the wit of man now with technology to create the necessary alerts that you can't give this drug out to someone without having gone through that. It's, it, there, there are all sorts of mechanisms within IT nowadays, and I know IT and the NHS don't particularly work well together. Um, so where the Secretary of State can come in is he can make sure the resources are there to enable these sorts of things to happen. But the people doing the prescribing, the person who signs, whether with a pen or electronically nowadays, that prescription for sodium valparate, in my view, is ultimately responsible, and they therefore have to take the uh, responsibility for implementing the PPP or whatever you want to call it, and for making sure those conversations are had within sufficient time, either for someone who is, because uh, this is not just about girls uh, approaching uh, the age when they can have children, it's also about women who've been seizure free for the last 10 to 15 years, they're now thinking of wanting to start a family, so they may have been on a very effective uh, form of contraception and they want to change. They need to have conversations, they need to understand the risks, they need to have t the time to do that. And I go back to ultimately it's the doctor who's got to do that and there has to be mechanisms to make sure that they do. I mean one of the things that we've heard in that context is if you're talking about neurologists and women as opposed to girls, um, neurologists, some neuro neurologists will, 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 will say, they've certainly told us, that they feel uncomfortable ill-equipped or uneasy about having that kind of conversation with a woman. They're a neurologist and they do neurology and they'll write prescriptions for sodium valparate but counselling people on pregnancy okay. is something that they're not currently... So, so if I can, I big up for the epilepsy specialist nurse for whom this is exactly meat and drink. This is what they are expert at. This is what they do now. We can have different arguments about whether there are enough epilepsy specialist nurses but certainly where there are the, the neurologist doesn't necessarily have to do, from my view, doesn't have to do the counselling, but they have to make damn well sure it happens before they sign their script. Are there enough epilepsy nurses, specialist nurses? Uh, not by enough, but there are more than there have been, and the numbers are growing, but no, by no, by no way are near enough. Could I possibly build on your point? Um, because what I think we need to avoid in any new system is a single point of failure. So if everything rests on the conversation with the neurologist, that's what we have. And of course, it's not just the neurologist who may feel uncomfortable, it may be the patient who feels uncomfortable having that conversation with them. And 
We need to just remember that timelines may be short. So we've spoken so far about a young girl who may become sexually active or an older woman who may be looking to start a family. But there are other cases too. We, there may be, for example, somebody who's had mistakenly had unprotected sex and is thinking about the morning after pill. Now, now that's a quick decision and they need to have at top of mind the other risks of a pregnancy. And, and if they can't find somebody sympathetic and expert to contact quickly, that, that, that's going to be a badly informed decision. So it needs to be not just one person that can be turned to for advice, we need to have multiple sources of advice. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would suggest that we don't just need to have a neurologist in the picture, we need to have an epilepsy nurse in the picture, we need to have good public information out there on websites, NHS Direct, and so on and so forth. And the people we haven't talked about yet, but who I know are very willing to step up, are pharmacists. Mm -hmm. Pharmacists are great at this stuff, actually. They're often really good at having really personal discussions, sometimes with people they know, sometimes with people who've driven 15 miles to be a point of pharmacist who doesn't know them. But they're accessible, they're open all hours, and you can have informed discussions with them. And I really think we don't want to put all our eggs into the neurology basket when we could have a chain of safety measures because that's what keeps planes in the air isn't it it's not just pilots it's engineers and so on as well mm. but as you say it's also about everyone knowing yeah right, including the woman in this instance yes the girl knowing yeah. that those mechanisms yeah. those support mechanisms yeah. those yeah. those are, those people who can advise and help are available yeah. and at the moment there is a lack of understanding there really is, and the other category of people who must know that, we mustn't forget, are the people who support people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So some of these people have learning disabilities and may be relying upon advocates or care workers, and many of them don't have close family support. And, and that's, that's another chain of difficulty that we just, we just need to be cognizant of when we're dealing with these very sensitive issues. Um, and of course, I hope it goes without saying, that the Epilepsy Society would be you know, so pleased to be asked to be part of that communication network is really what it needs to be to support the women concerned. I'm very conscious we could go on a yes, lot longer but right. unfortunately it's gone four o'clock and we've got another meeting I'm afraid. So um, I'll just ask my colleagues if you've got any further questions. Just, just one which you could perhaps write to us afterwards. Um, you talk about the work that you're doing with an international consortium to identify genetic markers of risk during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. I just wonder whether there's any updates on that that you might want to give back to us and we can write to that up. We, we will write to you. We're doing some very exciting work, yeah. Because I mean, one of the issues is why does it affect some women and yeah. others? And so no, no. if you're beginning to identify some of that, we'd really like to Yeah, it. no, it's important. So, no. no. It was the same question as Valerie, so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, thank you so much. And if there are other things that you feel we should have asked you and you'd like to give an answer to, uh, please just uh, notify us and all the rest of it. And as you've heard, we will ask you certain things. Uh, I want to thank you so much, especially coming with a sore throat. <laughs> um, and um, to say it's been a really, very, very useful um, session and uh, a great insight into some of these difficult issues. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Pleasure.